Shall Shipwrecked and stranded on a deserted island. And, uh, maybe, maybe not everybody knows the story, but we're not going to go there. The individuals came from various segments of society and show depicted the show depicted their struggles to live and work together so they could survive. The group needed to swiftly deal with any problems that arose to keep peace and prevent disaster. And I think sometimes, as I read that, and I was like, I really wasn't going to say it, but then I was like, as I read it, that's sometimes what's happening in the church because each of us come from a different background or we come from whatever outside these walls. Maybe we have a doctor. Maybe we have a lawyer. They don't get along. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Construction guy and a subcontractor. You know, So, I mean, it's different backgrounds. I'm just making that as an example. I'm not trying to say anything negative. So... <laughs> But by using the term kingdom, Jesus was describing his followers as a community. And that's what we are. We're a community of believers. A kingdom is made up of different kinds of people working together to serve one sovereign God. Right? So the Christian life is not a solo activity. Even though we're responsible for ourselves, it's not a solo activity. Especially where two or more are gathered in Jesus' name. Things happen, right? And this last week we prayed all through the week. We had more than two gathered, and we were looking for results. We're looking for things that could happen. So um, as we serve God together, we enjoy the benefits and encounter the challenges of living in a community. And I love that because we enjoy the benefits and encounter the challenges in life together. Pastor Rob is a quiet guy until you get to know him. He loves on you. <laughs> He, he, he shares his life stories, and I don't know how many times, maybe I've only heard it one other time, but about the, the, about the uh, corn crib. But anyway, 
I share a few stories of my past life too. But God is good and we get to enjoy and laugh together. But it's a learning lesson for all of us. So in today's lesson, we will consider the community aspects of the kingdom of God. There are tensions in any community and even with God's grace, people come to the kingdom with issues. Sometimes the conflict goes beyond hurt feelings and involves physical or financial damage. However, local Christians, communities, must learn to use God's wisdom to resolve issues before they thwart the kingdom impact. So we're going to get right into it. So Matthew 18, 1 through 5, if someone can be prepared to read that. Okay, Ron. Sometimes a person asks a question without realizing its significance. This was the case when the disciples asked Jesus, who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, Ron. unto him and set him in the midst of them. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child of my name receiveth me. Amen. So Jesus' disciples often <laughs> misunderstood the values of the kingdom, and he patiently worked to correct them. It is unclear what their motivation could have been for asking who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the Greek term translated greatest indicates rank or power. Jesus intentionally reached out to those who were considered unimportant to society's standards. The disciples must have also seen how Jesus regarded people who promoted themselves and valued status and rank, and yet appeared. Yet it appears the disciples had missed the point. Jesus ignored their request for ranking and chose to address the heart of the matter. Jesus called a little child to his side. Jesus explained, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Children exemplify faith, honesty, and humility, all of which are required by the kingdom. Now I'm going to stop right there before I get into any questions, but I look at children, and when they're playing in a big group, what do you think happens? They start to pick at each other. They start to grab that toy. I want that toy. You're, no, you got to share. you got to learn to share. <laughs> but God's not saying that. But they're, they're hungry for more than just that. They're hungry for knowledge. That's why they always ask, why? Why? And I got out of the vehicle this morning, and just to share with you, and Savannah, just as clear as I've never heard her before, says, good morning, Grampy. I've never, ever heard her say that so clear. And it's only been in the last couple of months where for the words, she is, she's just saying everything clear, clear. It's actually a lot of fun. So Jesus added, anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility is the foundation on which other spiritual virtues are built and reflects a sense of dependence on God. So I, I love this question. In what ways do we sometimes miss the difference between what is valued in the world and what is valued in the kingdom of God? This will, this will, go ahead. <laughs> I want to confess to you all and stand up and uh, say mm -hmm. that uh, I have used this verse and God has used it on me uh, about as much as most verses in the Bible because uh, I have a big mouth, know it all like everybody thinks you, uh, they know everything and arguments happen, and that's not the way to live life. But I went through all that as a young man, but when I got saved, then this verse, the Holy Spirit said, Bob, be careful that you don't, if you can judge uh, in uh, Ephesians 4, he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he's not judged by any man. So if you've been around Christianity for a long time and you're an elder or pastor, you've got the right to judge, but if you're 
young and you don't know the Bible and things, you should probably keep your mouth shut. So I learned to keep my mouth shut as best I can, but it, uh, the, and I'll finish with this. The main thing here is to make sure if you've got a problem with somebody, make sure you got the facts straight. Go to them and say, look, I'm having a problem with this. Am I right in thinking that you said this for this reason? And let the guy tell you what the truth is instead of assuming it and having an argument. So Amen. I thank God Amen. for his word, and this has been useful in my life. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for your honesty. You know, it's impactful. Uh, we all have verses that impact in our hearts and our minds, our lives. But I'll go back to the question a little bit again and see if anybody else has a feeling towards But In what ways do we sometimes miss the op difference between what is valued in the world and what is valued in the kingdom of God? What's well, I'll, sh I'll share a quick story because maybe we all hear it. As a new pastor was going into a church, nobody knew him, so he dressed up like a bum and went into the church, and nobody talked to him. I think we've all heard the story where he sat in the back because if they valued that person, kind of be belittled him. In fact, he tried to sit in the front, but they moved him to the rear. <laughs> you see my point <laughs> this morning? If anybody else wants to share on that. I just thought it was an interesting question because sometimes we do value worldly more than, than the kingdom of God. Book by its cover. What's that? It said, don't judge a book by its cover. Amen. Don't judge a book by its cover. Right. So in the kingdom of God, the uh, value ought to be taken spiritually. In the world, we take riches, we take status, we take position rather than spiritual confinement in God. Well, when we say we, you know, are we speaking about we as the body of Christ and the church, or are we thinking the world itself? I'll say we're saying the world, okay? Yeah. Okay, so the world's status, you know, reveres confidence, independence, success. That's a book on that. Yeah, success measured in in uh, accomplishment, wealth, education. In God's kingdom, he has the fruits of the spirit. And the value measured in, is measured like what Jorge was saying, you know, spiritual, you know, God is spirit, right? And those, those things of value in the kingdom are not puffed up. They have the element of love throughout and you know when I when we say we you know what, what we should uh, look at is that we have the same value system as the kingdom of God because we are in the world and not of the world amen amen, amen. that's that Christian community I like that I like that answer I like that all right, we're, one more question here. So, how have you witnessed childlike faith in someone else's life? Anybody have an example of that? How have you witnessed childlike faith in someone else's life? Yes, sir. Man, very impactful, isn't it? It's very impactful. I'll share one more thing. I'll, I'll get to you right there. Uh, is 
seeing the kids, the younger generation, the teenagers jump around up here and the Holy Spirit moving during praise. That's exciting to me. It's like I'm at a football game, but better. <laughs> but better, you know, and it's, it's exciting. We get to praise in Jesus' name. Childlike faith. I like, I like that. It's not being a child. It's childlike faith. There's a pizza fuzz flying around. Yes, sir. <laughs> First, along these lines, is First John 3.18, where uh, Paul says, My little children, love not in word and tongue. Don't spend your time talking about love you, uh, I love you. But indeed, do something for somebody or speak the truth. But, you know, just you don't have to talk about love. Do it. Amen. Show Amen. it. Let that action happen. Yes, sir. First John 3.18. Children, like I was an elementary school teacher for decades, a couple of decades, right? And children are oftentimes they don't speak for themselves, right? They they be afraid sometimes in situations to speak up for themselves. I've known some adults that way. Their heart is so pure, they don't feel comfortable even sticking up for themselves. And and even you, you see many times they get bullied practically because they don't. <coughs> And they will isolate and cry about it. And I, you know that sometimes as children do, you don't know what's going on in the playground oftentimes because you don't have eyes to see everything. Right. right. And then you find out that you know there's a child who isn't speaking up. Yet. They're just they feel something's wrong with them. You know. And you realize that. And when Jesus says, "Bring the children," you know, the, the humility of a child is that their heart is pure. And they, all they know is good, and they don't understand why anybody would not be good. And Amen. That's, that's a purity. Amen. And, and it doesn't take much to break their heart. They're very soft, very, very tender, very tender. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, right. <laughs> yep. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. We'll move on. Getting more into this. I love it. So, <clears throat> um, seek the lost. Matthew 18, 6 through 14. If somebody could be prepared to read that. So, God is concerned with the salvation of every person, not just the people we like. And He notices when His children are wounded. I'm going to, uh, hey, Bob. I'm going to go over to Tim on this one, so sorry. I saw you stand up, too. <laughs> Jesus had strong words for people who tempt others to sin or stand in the way of anyone coming to him. I, go ahead. Matthew 18. and drops to the sea. Who is the world be because of the Whoa. offset for offsets must come, but where to that man Whoa. for whom an offensive comes? If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it into the sea. Whoa. It is better for you to uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven without a hand and without a foot, rather than those who have hands and two feet uh, to cast into the everlasting fire. Wow. And if, if you your eyes causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into the Life with one eye rather than having two eyes to cast into the hell fire. Amen. Through 14. Uh, take heed that you may not be despite one of these little ones, for I say unto you that the heaven. Then angels uh, always are the face of my Father, 
who is in heaven. A couple more, but okay. Uh, Two more. Through 14. <clears throat> For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think if the man has a hundred sheep and one of them is run, goes astray, does it not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? In the same way that your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Jesus issued a severe warning against causing the little ones to stumble. It was referring to not just children, but to everyone who believes in him. Anyone who hinders the faith of a humble follower of Jesus will face severe punishment. Jesus said such a person would be better off having a millstone placed around their neck and being cast into the sea. Leading others into sin has serious consequences. Instead, a respectful treatment of each other should reflect the value God places on every person. Jesus uses strong imagery when he says that we'd be better cut off a hand or foot or gouge out an eye than to be the subject to the sin they cause. Then Jesus was not advocating self-harm. Instead, he was using hyperbole or exaggeration to make a point. He wanted his listeners to understand the extreme danger of sin. Jesus next tells the parable of the lost sheep, a more complete version of which appears in Luke 15, 3, 7. Like sheep, the little ones Jesus described need to be with the flock to where they can be cared for and continue to grow. And I like that as it points out why a church is needed. That's what we are, to be caring so people can grow. Amen? And God flourishes on that. And I, and I love that. So the shepherd in the story is our example. Jesus is teaching his followers to pursue those who wander from faith. His parable doesn't belittle the 99 who remain faithful, but elevates the importance of every individual in the kingdom of heaven. The apostle Peter, who probably heard this parable from Jesus himself, later echoed his words by describing the Father as not being willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In what ways do believers sometimes hinder other people's faith? Do believers, can we hinder other people's faith? I'm never judgmental and I'm never wrong. So I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Y'all laugh. <laughs> How can we do that? We're believers. We should be. Go ahead, Will. Should be a stumbling block in real life. They should. Then you should look right through that stuff. You know, because Jesus sure. loves that person. Sure. Because a lot of people judge. Say, oh, yeah, I will break. Yeah, but do you eat pork? You know what I mean? Let, you know what I mean? In other words, it goes both ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, let Let Jesus make the change yeah, in our life. Yeah, I yeah. I see where you're coming from on that one. Exactly. Yep. I agree. I agree. Anybody else? Ken? Yes. We're talking about you know the faith of children. That with the new believers, and sometimes a new believer, we expect them to understand all that God's expecting the moment they're saved. And just like what you were saying, we need to let Jesus work on them. Um, you know, Holy Spirit, yeah. We've said the story many times about the woman we knew who uh, her nephew's girlfriend wanted to come to church with her and she said oh no you're not coming to church with me until you stop living with him and you change your ways and you do this and you do that she just destroyed any faith that that woman would have she built she built a wall so she couldn't yeah exactly. judgmental yep yep I, i'm sorry nori were you done just I have to let jesus work on people and understand that there is a plan and a process. Right. Amen. Amen. I, I totally agree with that. And I think 
that plan and process involves the good soil, like we talked about last week. You know, if we could avoid being the rocks or the, oh, yeah. or if we could, as, a, as a body, if we could avoid being the rocks, the thorns, or the wayside, and we could be the good soil. Amen. I think that's a good goal. You know, because if we're the good soil, then they, <coughs> the new believers can take root. And, and strengthen their faith in God through us, the good soil. <laughs> it reminds me of in Wisconsin when we built our house, we, Merlin, he would say, you guys have the best soil. Anything you put in there is going to grow. We had tons of black dirt. Everything did grow. <laughs> but I mean, but that's, that's what we want our church to be like too. We want a good soil in our community of believers. Why? Like we can, on their way out for new people, I was thinking about this. If we just gave new believers on their way out a comic book and some crayons, what do you think they would do? <laughs> they probably wouldn't come back, right? We want some good soil. Hey, we love you. We, we, we enjoyed having your kids. We're going to give them a comic book you know, about Jesus. No, I'm, I'm just joking, but I'm just making a point. We want to have good soil here. And it starts with having good leadership. So, Amen. That's right. Yes, I was. Yes. God talks to them. And he, they talk to us. <laughs> Sometimes we forget out of the 99 what it's like to be the one. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think God ever wants us to forget what it's like to be the one. Because when that one walks through the door, that one needs to be the most important person because to Jesus, they are the most important person. <clears throat> it's, and when we do anything other than show them love and uh, give them opportunity to explore, because that's why they're here. They're exploring. Another option for them uh, in their life because they're lost, they're confused, they're not sure what to do. God brings them through the, the door, and if we start talking about <coughs> politics or, or, you know, things that don't matter, what matters to that person right now is they're lost and confused, and they're looking for direction and hope. They're not looking to talk about whether or not uh, so-and-so should be president or so-and-so, you know, what do you think about this conflict or that conflict? They got enough conflict. They're looking for hope. Amen. And Amen. so that's what we need to offer them, a smile, love, and hope. Right, right. And let, that let relationship. Jesus, let Jesus work out the rest of the stuff. Right, yeah. right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Just quickly, the, the discernment comes in because we're only men. You know, is it a, is it a sheep? You know, make sure that that one that see, appears to be lost is, in fact, a sheep, you know? Yeah. Um, because well, that, that always they, gets, because that they always gets grow. revealed at some point in time. Yeah, at some point in time. Yeah. Right, right. And Not it could be that. that. But just, just a factor. Yeah. Yeah. We want to know oh, yeah. No, there's people yeah. that will come in here and immediately they're a guest and they're, they hand me papers about what I should speak about. <laughs> they, want, they want to stand up and take the mic and it's like, come on. Like, yeah. you're, that, they usually reveal themselves right away, but then there's yeah. some that are really good at hiding. Yeah, you know why? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. It's, so, um, next question: What steps can Christians take to show everyone is valuable? And I, I think we've kind of hit on that a little bit. But anybody else want to share on that? Yes, sir. Right. 
and he reveals it. I love the story, but but it's interesting. I, as we're talking about a Christian community and the kingdom, uh, that community is here inside. But I also think it reflects on what we do outside these doors as well, because as they come in, the, as they come in, new people, as Pastor Craig was saying, is that they're hyper. And then Jorge was they're hypersensitive to anything, and they want to be sometimes judgmental. Oh, it's just another church that's going to judge me. They're looking for excuse not to sit back down and listen to God's word. That's where we have to be as Christian believers. Hello. You know what? You can sit right here. You know? Oh, sorry. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and welcoming culture. Inviting, meaning every one of our people are inviting people to church because we know that church will transform your life because God is here and, and they can be loved and welcomed and you don't you don't feel like you have a place to belong. Well I got a place where you can belong. Amen. And, and that's the church. And then once they get here and then it's a welcoming atmosphere. Where it shouldn't be just Pastor Craig and Pastor Rob and other leaders greeting the new guests. But every one of us should be greeting the new people. Right. We, we know who we don't know, right? I mean, and, and when we have an opportunity to, you know, I, I, every Sunday I say, hey, take a few seconds and greet five or six people sitting around you. Those aren't supposed to be your friends. Like, oh, it's like, you said around you, huh? Well, <laughs> you, you want, we want to go out of our, we want to go out of our way to greet anyone that we don't recognize and, and, and just, I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's confusing, and I know you don't know what to say, but you don't have to say anything except for, hey, uh, I'm, you I'm Teresa, and I'm glad you're here. It's, it's good to see you. Yeah. And then move on to the next person. That, Amen. Sure. Amen. Five, they, uh, five, if they shake or five or six people greet them, the, the percentage of them coming back skyrockets. That's right. Amen. That's what we want. We want them to get in a relationship with Jesus. Yes. Someone loved them. Someone showed them that they belong in church. And they were then able to experience God because they felt comfortable in their church. And that's what we want ultimately. We right. want to love people and make them feel like they belong so well that they're not worried about, oh, who's judging me? So they can focus on one thing and one thing only, and that's experiencing God in this place. Good point. Rachel's going to end up teaching this pretty soon as well. <laughs> How to be a greeter. <laughs> with, with that, a lot, you know, we have to remember, too, it's an individual choice. Yeah. So we want to give them, like you're saying, we want them to feel loved so that they will choose, they'll make a choice for God, you know, because it's an individual choice after all. Great. Right. Right? Right. right. So I think like, what you're saying would help them along with that choice that they want to choose to be. And, and another thing, like, when we when we leave, it's easier. It's easy. I find it way easier to, be, you know, to, to feel like a Christian when I'm in in Bible <coughs> on a Sunday in the, in, a, in a meeting place. The challenge is when you're in the world, Amen. you know. And then when we, you know, if we falter or if we see if somebody if we see somebody falter, you know, and then we see them sit in the church, we think, well, what do we? Do? Right. Well, personally, I would think, okay, well, if they're here. Okay, they're here. And a good Christian is a good repenter, right? And, you know, I want that same grace applied to me. But does the general population have that understanding, you know? And we can't count on that. So no. we want to be a Christian in the world all week so that when we do come here and sit down and, and 
express, you know, when we take communion, we can do so with a, a clear conscience, knowing that we are committed to our uh, relationship with God through Christ, and, and be that represented by the <coughs> and light of the world Amen. that he calls us to be for his glory right. through Christ. Amen. I remember somebody, a pastor back home, uh, our pastor back home, he said, he said uh, something encouraging, and it's along these lines of try to meet one person outside your bubble or try to talk to one person outside your normal about Jesus just a little bit, you know, and it changed. It changed who I was because that was hard because I was always around the Burtons, you know, and I was like, man, these guys... When am I going to find somebody new to talk to? But it was, it was, but it was somebody at a gas station. It was somebody at Home Depot. It was somebody at Menards. It was someplace where I could actually interact with somebody a little bit different. Of course, I got accused of flirting, but it wasn't flirting. It was just having a conversation. It was somebody a little different. All right, we'll move on. But I, but I like how Brad said that. I, I, I go ahead. That's right. So we'll move on to uh, Matthew 18. Wow, this is a good one. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Uh, somebody can prepare to re read that, uh, 15 through 17. So address conflict. Pre President Ronald Reagan once said, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to cope with conflict by peaceful means. Anytime people form a community, conflict is inevitable. At some point, so anybody want to read that? No. I'm gonna go. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go over here. We do usually don't hear from this. Sorry, Bob. 15 through 17. Right? <laughs> yeah, 18. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Yeah. Okay. Moreover, if thy brother shall trust pass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. He, if he shall hear thee, thou shalt. Thou hast gain thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. That's it. <laughs> you reiterating? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I didn't hear this. Yeah, 18. First. Oh, I thought it was through 17. Okay. <laughs> okay. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. So Jesus describes a four step method for resolving church conflict. <clears throat> if one believer sins against another, the offended person should go privately to the offender and, and tell him all his faults. No, I'm just kidding. Tell him his fault. So number two, if the offending party refuses to listen and to pursue reconcil 
reconciliation, then the offended party should take one or two others along with them and repeat the process. If the indiv- And then number three, if the individual still refuses to repent and be reconciled, the situation should be brought before the church. Number four, if the person who has sinned still refuses to respond, he or she should be treated like an unbeliever. If believers follow these steps, the church experiences unity and the kingdom will expand. If the instructions are ignored, the church will be unhealthy and the mission will be hindered. Discretion is always, is always a key ingredient for all of this. And most situations can be successfully resolved just by the first step. So in this way, the little ones Jesus refers to can be gently disciplined and learn to participate in the church community in a healthy, meaningful way. People who make minor errors in judgment as they are growing spiritually should be treated with grace. And I'm still getting a little bit of that grace from my wife after all these years. So thank you, honey. (laughs) As Proverbs 19.11 says, sensible people earn respect by overlooking wrong. And 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, Love does not hold grudges and will hardly notice when others do it wrong. Why do you think Jesus placed a high value on conflict resolution? Peace. Go ahead, Wilbur. Uh, you know, God's grace, he wants us to be gracious too. Okay. Because God, we're in the new covenant now. And God has grace upon us, the whole world. Grace of God, I got saved. I still want to finish that race. That's my goal every day. All the day comes that grace of Jesus. And uh, we should be gracious too, because God is gracious to us. Amen. And it's to the whole world. It's not just to one person or whatever. Right. You know, right now in Israel, that's a lot of grace. Huh. Yeah. I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I mean it. I mean yeah. it. No, God loves everybody. Right. You know, that's. I, I look at it the grace of God when I see this class. I mean. God's waiting for atheist evolutionist professors and lesbians and transvestites to get born again and follow, forsake their life and follow Jesus. I like and that. And follow Christ. You know, let's just follow and read the Bible and grow. There's hope. Yeah. Amen. I like that. Terrorists are terrorists included. Like you know, Jewish people, everybody. Amen. I, I agree. Yeah. I'll, I'll get you. I'll give you the end. <laughs> Forgiveness is a, is a crucial element to salvation. Without it, there's no salvation. Right. And, you know, grace and forgiveness go with each other. You know, that grace. And, and Jesus and Stephen, they modeled forgiveness in a way that we, you know, would benefit us to acknowledge. Forgive them for they know not what they do while they were <laughs> killing him. Right. In real time. Yeah. Forg- that's real time forgiveness of the people who were mocking him, scourging him, and crucifying him. And that's, that's and real forgiveness, real love. Yeah. That's the. Yeah. That is the. the There's a lot. And if we could attain that, even even close to it, we we wouldn't have to walk away from broken relationships and learn to forgive over the years, or we wouldn't have to walk away from an argument and. and lose sleep and try to work it out in our conscience, right. we would have that as a, as a tool to forgive in real time, which would really um, subvert any escalation of, of that conflict within the body at all. Amen. You know? Amen. Uh, this applies to all relationships, even those not in the church, our husband and wife or kids. Yeah. <coughs> If we use this example in all our relationships, we won't have nearly as many broken relationships as we have. And I find it interesting that the duty is upon the offended person. And so often I'll hear things like, well, I'm not going back to church there. I'm not doing this because so-and-so said something to me and I got my feelings hurt and I'm just, I'm done. And I'm like, okay, that person doesn't even know that you're mad at. Like, did you go to them and, and tell them that you they hurt your feelings? No. Okay, well, how are they supposed to ever work it out? Like, <clears throat> you're mad at them, but you're the one really giving up on the relationship. 
because the Bible tells us exactly what to do to mend relationships. And it's on us, if we're offended, to go to that person in private instead of 15 other people and tell them we're angry. Well, I like a team. Yeah. <laughs> and, and say, hey, did, you know, did you, many times we find that the person doesn't even realize they hurt your feelings. Right, right. Like, it, and it applies to every relationship. If my wife doesn't come to me and say, hey, why did you say that like that? I'll be like, man, I didn't have my coffee yet. I didn't even realize I said it like oh, that. I'm going to have to use that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can use that one. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, I'm sorry. Will you, will you forgive me, right? I mean, it, it, they can, our relationships can be fixed very quickly if we follow God's process. Right. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Speak this open up. Go ahead. I just want to add what he said because this is something I've learned in church. If you leave to go somewhere else because they offended you or something happened, unfortunately, that's going to follow you wherever you go. So you're going to have, may not be the same person, but you may have a similar issue wherever you go. Right. Right. So Good. it's just better off if you just suck it up. Good point. Um, I'm going to. God knows. I'm going to finish up here. Go, go ahead, Jorge. Yeah. Uh, not just one or two more, but also personal. Or your buddy, your big buddy and your little buddy. <laughs> right. Right. Amen. Amen. Wise counsel. Um, on that, can you can you close us out in prayer? Yes, sir. Thank you. Systems of oppression fueled by hate Held up by a lie we can't escape Humanity, a history of tragedy Does it have